Zanzibar had been part of Oman since they took it over from the Portuguese in the late 17th century, but in 1858 Said bin Sultan died and his realm was divided between his sons, with Sultan Majid bin Said taking Zanzibar. But his rule wasn't constrained to the island alone, as a centre of the slave trade in Africa, Zanzibar traders had trading posts as far away as central Congo. But when Bargash bin Said became Sultan in 1870, European powers began to encroach into Eastern Africa. For instance, a British adventurer and consul, John Kirk, was able to pressure the Sultan to agree to abolish slavery in 1873, but the trade still continued. Plus, European explorers challenged Arab slavers in the Congo, and in 1884, Carl Peters signed treaties with local tribes in modern-day Tanzania and established German East Africa. The Germans ended up angering the Sultan by forcing him to cede land, and like with the Ashabari riot in 1888, the locals rose up against them. British diplomats and traders, on the other hand, managed to foster good relations with the new Sultan, Khalifa bin Syed, so he agreed to give land to McKinnon and his East Africa company. But when Leo von Caprini became Chancellor of Germany in 1890, he settled the territorial disputes with Britain with the Heligoland Zanzibar Treaty. Germany gained the Heligoland and the Caprivi Strip, while Britain took Wituland and Zanzibar became a British protectorate. Nevertheless, Zanzibar still had a lot of influence in East Africa. For instance, one trader, Tipu Tip, largely governed Eastern Congo, but in 1892, he went to war against the Congo Free State and Arab influence was largely forced out of Central Africa. Plus, any would-be Sultan needed British approval before being crowned. This wasn't a problem when Hamid bin Fouani became Sultan in 1892 free as he was pro-British. However, as the British troops moved into Zanzibar to crack down on slavery, there were clashes with locals. But when he died suddenly in August 1896, his nephew Khalid bin Bargash moved into the palace and assumed the title of Sultan without the British approval. Basil Cave, the British diplomat in East Africa, ordered that he stand down on August the 25th. But this was ignored and Bargash began to deploy troops around the palace. Many of the 3,000 soldiers were armed with weapons presented to the former Sultans as gifts and the only ship in the Zanzibar Navy was a yacht, the HHS Glasgow, and that too was a gift from Britain. And their artillery included a Gatling gun, a 17th century cannon, and a couple of field guns the Germans gave to them. On the 26th, Cave got authorization from London to launch an attack, and two more ships joined the two he already had in the harbour. Bargash was given the ultimatum to leave the palace by 9am on the 27th of August or be forced out. At 8am, Bargash said he wasn't going to leave the palace, and Cave replied stating that he had no intention to fire upon the palace, but unless you do as you're told, we will certainly do so. At 9am, the order was given to fire upon the palace, and by 9.02, most of Bargash's artillery was destroyed, and the palace started to collapse with the 3,000 soldiers inside. By 9.40, the Sultan's flag was pulled down and all shelling had ceased, thus officially ending the 38-minute long conflict. Bargash fled to the German consulate after two minutes of fighting and was smuggled out of the country, but he was later found by the British and exiled to St Helena. 500 of his men died during the fighting and his supporters were forced to pay 300,000 rupees as reparation. Only one British sailor was wounded during the fighting, but he made a full recovery in hospital, and Britain was able able to install Sultan Hamoud on the throne and Zanzibar would remain a British protectorate for a further 67 years. And that was the Anglo-Zanzibar War, which is famous for being considered as the shortest war on record, clocking in at a whopping 38 minutes, which is this video played on repeat around 10 times. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, why not check out my channel? It's called Plainly Difficult, and I cover some obscure historical subjects that you may not have heard of.